much more Where can I go from your spirit Lord Where from your presence I flee If I rise on the wings of the dawn In the darkness you shine as the morn You are Good morning. 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 Thank you, Bobby. Morning. It's great to see you all this morning. It's great to be able to come together and worship with you all this morning. And our call to worship comes from Micah 718. Please hear the word of the Lord as we prepare our hearts and minds to worship our God and Savior. Who is a God like you who pardons inequity? and passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. Let's pray. Father, thank you for revealing your character to us. You tell us that you hate sin and rebellion, yet you pardon those who have rebelled against you. We ask ourselves why you would do this. And you tell us, 
It's because you delight in loving your people by forgiving them. And Father, we praise you because this reality does not change. You loved your people 2,000 years ago, and you still love your people today. This love is vividly seen at the cross. Forgiveness cost your beloved son his life. He died so we could live. We who believe and trust in his life, death, and resurrection, we who trust in the promises of God and Christ fulfilling those promises, and we who continue and grow in our trust are forgiven and restored to you. Father, please increase this trust. Help our unbelief. Help us believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us remember that the power that raised Christ from the dead and established the church is the same power that we have to help us believe and change. May we grow in mortifying our sin and grow our character and doctrine so we can grow in our love for you and others. Thank you that we have you, your word, and your people to help us with this. Amen. Please stand as we begin our time of singing, uh, lifting our voices in praise to the God who cares for us so tenderly and so fatherlike. Here we go. Praise my soul, the King of heaven, to his feet I dream.
Search me and know all my ways, O oh Lord. You know when I sit and when I rise. In me and from behind and before, knowing all my thoughts and much more. Where can I go from your spirit? Where from your presence I flee If I rise on the wings of the dawn In the darkness you shine as the morn You are there You are there I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Open secret, you saw me, Lord. The rod in the depths of the earth. All of the days you ordained for me, written down before I. Precious to me are your thoughts, O oh Lord. To count they are more than the sand. When for justice I earnestly cry, search me then for my heart cannot hide. You are there. You are. Fearfully and wonderfully made. Sing again. For you created my inmost being. You formed me in my mother's womb. So I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Yes, I'm. Fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. Be seated. Our scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. And we've observed how Paul has been encouraged by the church there in Thessalonica. And last time we saw how he was encouraging them to excel still more. And today we'll see how Paul comforts them by informing them of the return of Christ, the future return, and the future resurrection for believers. So please hear the word of the Lord. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, Even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain 
will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the peace and comfort that hope brings. We confess that we often respond to trials as if we didn't have hope. Please forgive us. Help us remember that we may be afflicted without being crushed, perplexed without despairing, persecuted without being forsaken, and struck down without being destroyed. We can do this because we do have hope. We have hope because of Christ. Comfort us as we remember what Christ has done and what he will do when he returns, and help us always to point others to the hope that is found only in his precious name. And Father, please awaken and tenderize our hearts this morning so we can receive your word. Satisfy us this morning with your steadfast love so we can give you the glory you deserve. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and continue to sing. What a beautiful phrase that in Christ we were guaranteed to always be with the Lord. Amen. Great reflection of his mercy among other things. We'll sing about his mercy now together and in response to that, sing of how we can rest in that mercy and rely on him to always be a lamp for us. Here we go. A debtor to mercy alone, of covenant mercy I see. I come with your righteousness on my humble offering. Judgments of your holy law with me and have nothing to do. My Savior's obedience and blood hide all my transgressions from you. The work which your goodness began of your strength will come clean your promise is yes and amen and never was forfeited yet the future of things that are now no power below or above can make you your purpose forego or sever my soul from my name from the palms of your hand eternity will not erase amen if pressed on your heart it remains in marks of indelible grace yes i to the end Until I bow down at your throne Forever and always secure Forever and always secure Forever and always secure A debtor to mercy
As I sojourn across this desert Through the plains of doubtful nights Seek the words that guide my footsteps Let them shine as stars so bright Everyone point me northward to that country Where my soul will find its home Be a lamp for all my days And I will walk in endless joy Ladies You're the lamp, the light of heaven Dawn of mercy for all men Father, what comforting words that are only comforting because of who you are. We can rest in your mercy. We can rest in your wisdom, your goodness, your love, your holiness, and your sovereignty at all times. And we ask that the words of what we just sang, that even in deep, dark trials, that we would see the gospel through those trials and your mercy and your love as we've never seen them before. We think about those things now, Lord. We pray for the Appersons and many others who are experiencing difficulty now. And we ask for our church to be the hands and feet of Jesus in these times, to compassionately extend that love for the gospel, for the purpose of, of demonstrating to others that we are true disciples of Christ by how we love for one another, as well as for the sanctification of our church body and the families involved in that. We pray for your blessing today on the words of scripture that have been read to us that have been sung by us and referenced by us and spoken by us in our fellowship and are about to be preached to us that your spirit within us would enlighten our eyes and would help to move us to respond in obedience and growth to those things we thank you that you are our god and that we rest in christ alone in his name we pray amen <clears throat> I invite you to take your Bibles this morning. If you'll turn to Job 32. Job 32, we're going to pause our study of Hosea this morning and take a, just a moment to look at a, a key text here. If you're not sure where Job is, if you find the middle of your Bible, you'll find the Psalms. And then right before the Psalms is Job. You're familiar probably with the story of Job and the man who suffered much. And, and Job is, um, it's, it's not the first book in our Bible, that's Genesis, but it's probably the first book written. It was written even before Genesis was written. It didn't take place before that, obviously, uh, but it was written first. And, and in that sense, it serves as a, as a theological prelude or preface or prequel to everything else that you read in the Bible. A lot of the major themes, in fact, all the major themes are, are begun or established in seed form in the book of Job. And you don't have to, to live very long to know that the world that we live in is, is fallen and things are not as they should be. And I received a call on Wednesday night that opened up a, a whole new experience of pain and suffering for our congregation and one family in particular that I have not experienced before. And I think many, that would be true for many of you. And, and honestly, I haven't been able to think about much else since then. And, and it's in moments like this that there's a right impulse amongst believers. And I'm not talking about the world this morning. I'm talking about what's going on out there and all the craziness. I'm just talking about us. 
This is a family discussion this morning. There's a, there's a good impulse amongst believers, and that is to, in moments of tragedy and suffering and difficulty, to want to say something, to want to do something, to want to be present. Let me encourage you. That is a good thing. Uh, to want to say something, to want to help, to want to help with your words, to want to be there for them, to want to do something that would reach out to them in, in some way, those who suffer. And as I was thinking about that, and as we were driving to the hospital on Wednesday evening, um, my mind, my thoughts just kept going back to Job, and not just Job in his situation, but Job and his counselors. On Easter, a couple months ago, a few months ago, I did, I did something I've never done on any previous Easter. One was I preached to an empty building, and two, I preached from Job, and the resurrection in Job, and yes, it's there. Uh, and the central message of Job is that there is a Redeemer, and, and, and if we kind of zoom out for a moment, the book has it all, and if you're not familiar with the story, here, here's what you need to know. The the book of Job is, just has a little bit of everything going on in it. You have a hero that goes through heartbreaking disaster. You have interesting characters who act as foils. They're supposed to be friends, but they act as foils to Job's path. You have a crazy wife or one who is not helpful, shall we say. Uh, you have a behind-the-scenes conversation between God and Satan. You have all kinds of things going on there. You have the journey of friendship, the loss of family, the unimaginable physical suffering, strained marriage, quandary over deep philosophical, theological questions, and, and, and surrounding all of this is the ever-present smell of death and disease. And the suffering and calamity part is, is primarily at the beginning, and then it's somewhat resolved at the end, but there's 40 chapters in between that. We think of chapter 1 where everything just opens up and it gets terrible very quickly. We think of chapter 42 where most everything is resolved. And if you ever hear that everything's resolved in the end, that's not the case. If you ever hear a sermon to that end, it's wrong. Because the man didn't get his children back. There were still, still things that were lost. In fact, the, the, the book closes with his real friends probably some family members, extended family, consoling Job because he's still feeling the pain of loss. But it's all there. But what about the middle? There's a lot of ground there. I think people are intimidated by this book because the understanding that a lot of us have is not caught up with the reality of the meaning of the text. Uh, when the message of Job, what I mean by that is when the message of Job is, is really opened up to us and we see that it's infinitely more than a philosophical text whose meaning is impenetrable, what it actually is a very encouraging text that points us to God. And the more we understand this book, the more we see God's heart of wisdom. In fact, it's even part of the, what's so-called the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. And in this, we see God's heart of wisdom and how he meets us where we are, his desire to meet us beyond all of our superficial needs. Just a quick review, because this provides some background for us. At Easter time, we, we looked at the big questions of Job, which are really the big questions of all of Scripture. These questions set the course for Scripture. It doesn't answer them all in the particulars. It answers them in very big general terms. But all the questions are there. And, and the questions come out like this. And this is just review here. Is there an arbiter for me? And we saw this in Job chapter 9. That is someone who can represent both parties, God and man. Job uh, stated it this, this way. He says, is there someone who can lay hands on us both? Meaning, is there someone who can, who can lay hold of God and mankind in his problem, me and my problems? Is there an arbiter for me? Is there an intercessor for me? He talked about that in Job 16. Is there a way where I can plead to God? Is there somebody who will listen to me? In my cries, in my desperation, in my pain, in my suffering, is there anyone there? In Job 19, the question is, is there a redeemer for me? What an amazing chapter, Job 19. Job knows that his Redeemer will not only plead his case, that even if Job dies, and he does, 
That even if he dies, he says, after his death, from my flesh, I will see this redeemer. Meaning, Job is telling us right there at the very beginning, here's a hint, a resurrection is coming. Right there in Job 19, the very beginning. And he says there that even if he dies, he has a redeemer that will plead his case and redeem him from the pit. The final question was, is there a mediator for me? We we saw that at the end of Job 33. We'll return to that a little bit this morning. Is there a mediator for me? Is there someone who can ransom me from my sins? Is there someone who can help? Well, now with the rest of Scripture filled in, we know the answer to these questions as believers, don't we? We do have an advocate that speaks for us. We do have a witness that defends us. We do have a redeemer that died for us. We do have a mediator that is merciful to us. We do have all of these things and all the big questions that Job anticipates are answered in whom? In Jesus. He is the fulfillment of that anticipation. Job could not see all the details, but he knew the questions and those questions are given to us at the very beginning. Now, a little bit more in the way of background and, and help to understanding this is what's happening in those chapters between the first and the last. And what happens is Job has three friends that come on the scene and they run because their friend's suffering. Bill, Dad, Zophar, Eliphaz. Three really odd friends. And, and if you might, you might understand them this way. Uh, Bill, Dad, he's, he's the scientist. Ring a bell with anybody here? He's the scientist. And, and as you read his words to Job, he's really dealing with, and all of them are dealing with cause and effect, but he's really explaining things from nature. Cause and effect from nature, which, by the way, as a counselor, is just not always helpful. It's one thing to observe certain things in creation and through scientific inquiry, but, but to reason from that back to God will oftentimes lead us astray, and it will lead us astray if we do not have the light of divine revelation shining on it. He, Bildad, in his scientific inquiry, he, he makes observations. He says, well, just like, you know, papyrus uh, needs water and marsh, um, you know, the reason why they're suffering, the reason why your children are dead is because there's sin in their life and in yours. Not helpful, Bildad. Why don't you keep your science to yourself? Your children are dead because they were in sin. That's what he says to his friend in his suffering. Zophar comes on the scene. He's not much better. He's the philosopher of the group. And and he looks at cause and effect through philosophical ponderings and trying to get inside the mind of God, which is not possible except for what God has chosen to reveal of himself. And he presumes all manner of things about God and puts himself in the place of God and what God would say. And he's wrong more often than not. You have another friend, Eliphaz. He's the historian in the group. And so he looks at cause and effect through history, the the cyclical nature of of the way things go. Well, it happened this way before. That's why it's happening now and and so on. And, And here's a central issue with these three. These three friends, they all come to Job and they look at Job as a problem to solve and not a soul to care for. Job is not their problem, and yet they treat him as a problem. And there's another question around these three friends. Are they believers? Are these guys, do these guys belong to God? Well, we don't know for sure. There's not enough information there. But what we do know is this, and this is unmistakable, that their counsel is definitely polluted with humanistic thinking. It's, it's definitely filled with worldly ideas. And the problem that makes that question so hard is because they try to take godly good counsel and it, they mix it in with Canaanite counsel. In fact, all three of their names have a Canaanite background, meaning to the Israelites or to those who are in the formation of the nation, uh, like Job and another friend that we're going to see, these are outsiders, these are foreigners, and they're bringing in their, their foreign philosophy philosophies with them. It's not to say all foreigners do that. That's not the point. But but in that context, to be a Canaanite is to be outside of the wisdom of God. And so their counsel and their perspective is contaminated. It's diluted at best. 
And you see that in the things that they say. They, they were in the truest sense of the modern term integrationists when it came to providing counsel. Because with their counsel, there's just enough truth baked in, but it's laced with poison that if followed, it will kill. This is why it's hard to discern where they're coming from at times. It's what makes this book very difficult on many of those passages. Because they'll say things that have a ring of truth, but if you follow it down the path that they're laying, it will lead to destruction. So they're not very helpful. Job, in his wisdom, and he is a wise man, he, he, even in his pain, he recognizes that to a certain degree. In Job 16, he says, I, I've heard, after he listens to them some, he says, I've heard many such things. Sorry, comforters are you all. Then he says, is there no limit to the windy words? The word he uses there is gaseous. <laughs> I like Job's sense of humor. Your words are not very helpful. Starting in chapter 32, there's another friend that enters the story, and he's unlike the other three in every way. The, and this man's name is Elihu. And, and you have the speeches of Elihu that begin in chapter 33. He's introduced in chapter 32. And you have a number of speeches. And, and as he enters the story, he plays a key role in understanding the rest of the book. He's really the setup for what is about to come. There's a whirlwind that's coming, and it's going to have God in it, Job. In short, Elihu points Job back to God. If I can sum up all of Elihu's counsel, listen to God. He does speak. He does. Some commentators that you read will say that guys like Elihu here uh, were misled as the other three were, and, and that he's not somebody to, to follow here. Others will say he's a good guy who, in this story, and there's all kinds of issues with that. How do we solve the problem of Elihu in this? Well, perhaps the wisest position is just to let him speak for himself and, and take his words at face value. We can do that with the other three and we can do that with him here and let him speak for itself and, and see where this goes and see even God's commentary on this. In fact, after all of this, and all, there's a little bit of a spoiler alert, um, God will condemn and he will judge the other three and their words and their counsel and he will not do that to Elihu, which is alerting us to the fact that he is good in his counsel. He's the only friend not condemned by God. And I believe that's because he's right. He is the one who introduces the initial ideas that God will take up and address directly with Job. So, so in a sense, understand his position this way. Understand that Elihu is a prophet-like person for Job, kind of like a John the Baptist. He is a forerunner of God. He is coming along and saying, God is coming. He's going to speak. He's going to show himself directly to you. Listen to him. In fact, that's what he says. Listen to him. He does speak. And God will do that, starting in chapter 38. God is going to deal with you directly, and you need to listen, Job. Look at chapter 32, and here we, we have where Elihu is first introduced here. We're going to not spend too much time here. We're going to spend the bulk of our time in chapter 33, but notice how he's introduced. And, and always look for the things that are repeated here to give emphasis to what's being stated. Chapter 32, then these three, the other three friends, ceased answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. They got fed up. Even they saw some issues arising with Job, even in their blindness to the real issues. And Job just kept justifying himself to them. And then here's Elihu standing on the sidelines. But the anger of Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzzite, and the family of Ram burned. Now, you might think that doesn't mean a whole lot to me, verse 2. What is it telling us? It's telling us very, something very significant. The, the background of those other three is Canaanite in origin. But here we learn that... Elihu is likely a, a cousin of Job. He's in the family. He's from the, the Israel stock of, of the root of Abraham. We know that because his, his family members, Uz and Buzz, uh, are mentioned there in Genesis 22. And so he's, he's one of Job's people. He, he's, he's in the family, so to speak. He's, he's one of God's people. 
And yet the anger of Elihu burned. You see that there. And against Job, verse 2, his anger burned. Because Job justified himself before God. And his anger, Elihu's anger, burned against his three friends because they found no answer and had yet condemned Job. All you've done is give this guy bad news. You've consigned him to his own suffering and his own misery, and you haven't helped him. Now Elihu had waited to speak to Job because they, those other three, were years older than he. And when Elihu saw that there was no answer in his mouth, the of the three men, his anger burned. Are you noticing a trend here? Here's, here's what took place. Those other three were older men than Elihu. Elihu, in his wisdom, wisely waited by for those other three older men to speak. That is the way of the ancient Near East. It's not so much anymore, although it should be. But to let the older speak first, let wisdom lead out. And he's waiting, and he's waiting, he's tapping his foot, and he's waiting, and it doesn't come. Now, this turns man's wisdom on its head because by and large in the Old Testament, uh, a man with, with a gray head of hair or a bald head uh, is, is a man to, to listen to. He's a man who has some wisdom. He has some years. But in this case, wisdom is turned on its head, so to speak. And it's the young man who speaks up. It's the young man who corrects and brings comfort And he says in verse 6, I am young and you are old. Therefore, I was shy and afraid to tell you what I think. I thought age should speak and increased years should teach wisdom. Notice verse 8 very carefully. But it is a spirit in man and the breath of the Almighty that gives them understanding. He says something here that is absolutely theologically crucial to the whole message of Scripture. Where does truth come from? Where is truth? Where does it reside? Does it reside within man? Only if God by his spirit makes it alive in man and ultimately understanding in the ultimate sense of truth comes only from the almighty. It comes from God himself. Special revelation is needed. In fact, that should alert us here in verse 8 to something that we might see later on in the New Testament, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that all Scripture is inspired, theonoustos, breathed out by God. It comes as a form of His breath. All of the Word of God is from God. It's an extension of His divine character. It is Him speaking. Even though He does that through channels, He does that in a way that represents who He is fully and completely to His people. The breath of the Almighty gives understanding. And so because of that, that's what Elihu will rest upon. And, and also it means that he will not employ the apologetical and, or reasoning uh, of the foreigners, of the Canaanites in this sense. In fact, he says that at the end of verse 14. I'm not going to reply to Job with your arguments, talking about the arguments of his friends. I'm not going to use their reasoning. Now, this is important, and, and why is it important? Because this brings us to chapter 33, where is Elihu's first speech. And this is what I want us to spend the rest of our time looking at this morning. It's notable here that in chapter 33, verse 1, listen to this. This is the first time after 32 chapters that Job hears his own name. And I know what you're thinking, so What? <laughs> That tells us something. In the same way certain things are emphasized, like the, the anger of Elihu burning against this worldly, godless counsel, this misguided counsel. In the same way things are emphasized by the way they're repeated, the Bible also emphasizes things by laying silent on it and then bringing it in at just the right moment. Such as mentioning the main character's name to his own ears for the first time in chapter 33, verse 1. And he hears it on the lips of Elihu. His three friends avoided even mentioning his name. Their counsel was formal, it was stiff, it was detached from any sense of relationship. 
And as we get into chapter 33 this morning, I, I want us to reflect on something here. This is what I've been thinking about this week is how we counsel one another. How do we care for each other in the body of Christ? Are there questions that I need to consider before I open my mouth to speak? Are there presuppositions that must guide and guard my good desire to want to help someone in their suffering? So what I don't want to do is, is throw fire on anyone's desire to want to help fellow believers, especially those who are suffering in our midst. What I do want to do is cause us in some respects to pump the brakes in certain areas and help us think more biblically about some of these things. There's some really good help that comes to us through the mouth, through the vessel of Elihu to Job and for our benefit in chapter 33. I want us to consider this this morning. Number one, Am I living my own counsel? Am I living my own counsel? Am I under the weight of my own teaching? Everyone who teaches, preaches, counsels, disciples should always be asking that question, but every believer should be asking that question. After he addresses Job in 33 verse 1 and 2, and he says, I'm going to open my mouth. I'm going to, I'm going to speak to you, Job, and I want you to listen. This is what he says, verse 3. This is 33 verse 3. My words are from the uprightness of my heart, and my lips speak knowledge sincerely. He's already told us where knowledge comes from. Understanding comes from the Almighty. And so he's not saying, I'm just reaching into my grab bag of wisdom from my you know, 20-something years or whatever how old he was. He's not saying that. He's wanting to speak rightly, but he also wants to speak with a pure heart. I want to make sure my heart is right, that it's aligned with what I'm about to say. That's always the tension for anyone who preaches and teaches. It's true even in this very moment, and that is that anyone who opens God's Word to someone else, counseling, discipleship, and anything else, we're always holding up a greater standard than what we hold personally, because we're fallen, yet redeemed, and yet we lived in the, in the tension of the already, not yet. We are redeemed, and yet we are not what we will become. And yet, God tells us in, that same, in the same scriptures that that's the kind of persons that he uses. That those are the people that he uses. And he says, we have this treasure in what? Perfected vessels? Is that what he says? Earthen vessels that are damaged, that are cracked that have all manner of problems. And yet that is what the Lord uses to make the, the, the power of the gospel known to a lost and dying generation. Am I living under my own counsel? I'm going to walk through these very quickly this morning in not my typical fashion. Um, each one of these is a sermon in itself, so I'm going to have to just keep moving. Am I living under my own counsel? If you don't understand what that means, come see me. Number two, am I dependent on God? Am I dependent on God? Verse 4, the Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Elihu is approaching this from the standpoint of a Godward dependence. He understands that if I have anything to say and do to help my dear friend Job, it's going to be because God has put me in that situation, but also that God will provide for me in that situation. I have to have a dependence on him. And that, that doesn't start by just saying and praying a mantra, Lord, I'm dependent on you. What it means is that there is a theological self-awareness that God has undergirded my life from the very beginning. We sang this this morning from Psalm 139. The Lord knit me in my mother's womb. Uh, everything I have is from him. He says, the spirit of God has made me. It's his breath that has given me life. This, this is a, an allusion back to something, isn't it? Genesis 1 and 2. Where, where does the life of man come from? It comes from God picking up a, a, a yet lifeless Adam and breathing life into his nostrils. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. Isn't that wonderful how that's used interchangeably here in 32 and 33? It's the breath of God that speaks his word to us. It's the breath of God that gives us life. Number three, am I open to correction? Am I open to correction? He says in verse five, refute me if you can, array yourself or array your words before me, take your stand. And in other words, there, there's a humility here. I, I, I could be wrong. 
I may not have all the facts. I may not have all the information that I need. And, and there needs to be a, a careful sense that we carry into any situation in which we want to minister to someone else in the body. He's not saying, you know, with a, an attitude of arrogance. It's been wrongly interpreted that way. That's not the spirit of this text, of what, of what Elihu is saying here. He's not saying, you know, prove me wrong if you can, punk. That's not what he's saying here. He's actually saying, I could be wrong. There, there's, a, there's a tone of humility here. There's a, a posture of that. Check it out, Job. I may not have all the facts. We can walk into a situation and, and so-called read the room wrongly, right? Read the situation. You seemed really upset the other day. Well, why would you think that? Well, we were, we were having a salad together, and you had this sour look on your face, and it seems like something I said was wrong. No, did you taste the salad? It was awful. You might not have all the information. He says, refute me if you can. That, that is to reverse an impression or thinking. Correct me if I'm wrong. Number four, am I compassionate with sinners? Am I compassionate with sinners? We might say, I could add a word to this, with my fellow sinners. He says there in verse 6, Behold, listen, I belong to God like you. I too have been formed out of clay. Does that ring a bell, Genesis 1 and 2, again? I'm cut from the same cloth. I'm from the same lump. I'm a man just like you. If you want some real practical help on this, see chapter 8 of Paul Tripp's Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands, where he talks about how we must learn to identify with suffering. He talks a lot about what that doesn't mean. It doesn't mean what a lot of people think it means, but what it does mean. It doesn't mean that we replay the role of Job's three misguided friends, where misery loves company. Yeah, that's, that's really, that's, that's hard news. That's really bad. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's tough. Okay. <laughs> I knew that already, Job could say. You know where people say things and they're trying to bridge a gap there? They're trying to find, they're straining at finding a common denominator that probably doesn't exist and they just need to be there with them? It is actually to Elihu's credit that he endear, endured and endeared himself to Job but endured all of that time of listening to all this false counsel before he opens his mouth. He, he sat there and listened. He was taking notes. Am I compassionate? Am I, am I identifying with the suffering of others? Biblically, this means a, a few things. One, we, we need to realize we're in the same family. Adam's helpless race. We're all in that family together. Two, we're in the same position in that family. We are all fallen sinners. No, no one made it out of that. We all got drugged down together. He, he is ahead of sorts to us, Paul says in Romans 5. And also, we share similar experiences because of that position. And that's sometimes where we run first without really doing the groundwork before that. We want to run to our common experiences rather than just listen and be compassionate toward those who are suffering. What is the goal of that kind of compassion? Well, the goal is to point them to Christ. Elihu is pointing him to God. He doesn't have all the information of what God's going to do in his redemptive historical plan and all the things that we know at this point that have happened uh, in Scripture subsequent to Job. But what he does know is that God is who he says he is, and he's pointing him to God. And the goal of this compassion is to point them to Christ, not us. It is to approach every situation with humility and honesty, and yet always with hope. So important. It's important to understand that this is more than just sharing our similar miserable experiences. When you identify with fellow sinners, you are demonstrating that your suffering doesn't belong to you. It belongs to Christ who uses it to comfort others. It's not, and I hope you will take this in the right sense, it's not your story. 
It, it, it belongs to the Lord. All that we have belongs to him, including not just the, the riches and the joys and the wonderful experiences of life, praise God for those, but also the suffering and the pain. That belongs to God for him to use it as he wishes. Paul said it this way to the church at Corinth. Comfort others with the comfort with which you have been comforted. That's our goal. Comfort others with the comfort that you have been comforted with. Have you been comforted? Have you been encouraged? Have you been helped? Have you been ministered to? Have you been prayed for? Have you had physical, financial needs met by others in the body of Christ? Have, has someone else come alongside, put their arm around you and encouraged your marriage, your parenting, encouraged your children? Comfort others with the comfort with which you've been comforted. Has someone in this church at some point come alongside you and, and spoken the gospel to you and you believed and now here you are? Comfort others with such comforts. Our goal in this is not to connect the dots between their experiences and my own, but to show compassion because their condition is my own. Number five, am I modeling true humility? Am I modeling true humility? Look at verse seven. Behold, or listen, no fear of me should terrify you, nor should my pressure weigh heavily on you. Job, I'm your friend. Really. I even remember your name, unlike the others. Job, you don't need to be afraid. I'm, I'm, I'm right here with you. This is the spirit of Galatians 6, looking to yourself lest you too be tempted. This is Elihu saying, I'm, I'm, again, just like we saw in the verses before this, I'm cut from the same lump of clay, just like you. But you, what I'm going to say to you shouldn't terrify you, it should comfort. I'm not here to weigh heavily on you and to add excess baggage to your burdens. Who does this sound like, by the way? You know who this sounds like? It sounds like Christ. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. To model this kind of true humility, friends, listen, it means that in our counsel, our preaching, our teaching, our discipleship, our one anothering, it means that we're not going to lay a heavier burden than what Christ does on that person. In fact, we're there to help shoulder burdens and, and carry burdens and fulfill the law of Christ, Galatians 6 again, that we're to point them to the, the gentle and humble spirit of Christ and how he meets us where we are in that. To do that, we need to model true humility. Number six, uh, don't worry, there's only 55 more of these. Number six, am I listening well? Am I listening well? Notice carefully verses 8 through 11. Surely you have spoken in my hearing, and I have heard the sound of your words. Then the NAS, at the end of verse 8, there is a colon there, and then beginning in verse 9 are quotation marks. Speaking beginning in verse 9 through 11 are the words of Job. So what Elihu is doing is saying, here, here's, I'm going to play the tape back for you in your own words. This is what you have said. You've said things like this on more than one occasion. What did Job say? Verse 9. I'm pure without transgression. I'm innocent. There's no guilt in me. Listen, he, he's talking about God here. Job says, God invents pretexts against me. God counts me as his enemy. He puts my feet in the stocks. He watches all my paths, end quote. How did Elihu get all that? This is listening 101. This is data gathering 101. Listen to what they're saying so you can, one, understand, and then, two, properly respond. How do we know Elihu was listening well to Job? Well, here we see he repeats his words back to him, starting here. And actually, this will continue all the way through chapter 36, through the, the few different speeches of Elihu. He just keeps repeating Job's words back to him, almost word for word in most cases. Sixteen times he repeats Job's words back to him. 
you said this. I've been listening. This is, these are your own words. Here's what you said. Now, here's what God says. The first thing he remembers out of Job's mouth, 33 verse 9 there, I am pure. Which, by the way, Job said that on six different occasions. You know what the very last thing that Job said? And I've heard this recently out in the world multiple times. The very last thing that Job said that Elihu quotes him on is over in chapter 36, verse 23, where he says, Job says, God has done me wrong and there is no justice. You'll never make sense of the latter if you don't understand the former. If you don't understand the goodness and the righteousness of God in all his ways, you, you can cry for justice all day long and you'll never find it. That's what Job did. Why is there no justice? Well, pff, God, God's done us wrong. That's what Job said. Am I listening well? Number seven, I told you, 55. Am I prepared to speak the truth with boldness? Am I prepared to speak the truth with boldness? Look at verse 12. Behold, or listen, let me tell you, you are not right in this. For God is greater than man. To Elihu's credit, he has sat back, he has listened, he's deferred to older men that should have been able to speak wisdom. They did not in that case. And now he is, he is appealed to Job. I'm, I'm just like you. I'm a fallen sinner. I could be wrong. I'm approaching this with humility. I'm coming at this and examining my own heart in this matter, even my own claims to purity. But now, I need to tell you something that might be hard for you to hear. You're not right. There's a boldness in that, isn't there? There's two equal yet opposite dangers in giving counsel, and I see both of these all the time in the church in a lot of different ways. One is to immediately dive in where angels fear to tread and speak hastily, to speak, to speak quickly, to speak without love, to speak without gathering facts, to speak without measuring careful wisdom. It's, it's sometimes speaking more than we know and all those kind of things. There's an opposite danger. And that's to sit by their side and never say anything at all, thus missing out on providing real hope, real encouragement, and carefully measured counsel in the time of need. It takes a lot of biblically grounded wisdom to know the path between those two errors. And if you're not sure how to do that, watch those who do it well and learn from them in the church. That's mentorship. Titus 2, that's in the right sense, that's godly, wise, older men and older women who their character exudes the life of Christ and they see that and they are worthy of following in that sense. Am I prepared to speak with boldness? It's only after Elihu has built trust and established the right framework that he begins to boldly address Job's complaint and his accusations against God. Number eight, am I pointing them to the truth? Am I pointing them to the truth? You see this in verse 13. Why do you complain against him? That's God. Why do you complain against God, Job, that God does not give an account of all his doings? Is, is God obligated to do that for us? But let's go with that argument for a moment, Elihu says in verse 14. Indeed, actually... Contrary to what you think, God does speak. In fact, once, twice, and even when he does speak, no one listens. No one even notices. Elijah gives some examples from the time of early Israel and even on into the time of the prophets where the writer of Hebrews says God has spoken in many different ways and times and epics and, and yet now he's spoken definitively in his son Jesus Christ. But in, in the old days... He did this. Verse 15, in a dream, a vision of the night, when sound sleep falls on men while they slumber in their beds, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction that he may turn man aside from his conduct and keep man from pride. He keeps 
back his soul from the pit and his life from passing over into Sheol. What is all of that about? He's saying that God has a prophetic role in, in declaring his word, and he's done that through prophets and through the patriarchs. Just ask Jacob and dreams and all kinds of visions and those kind of things, and yet it did not always uh, accomplish in the sense of what man should have gotten from that what, what God intended. Instead, what they got was judgment. And in that sense, God's word always accomplishes what it intends. God would speak to them in order to turn back their lives from the, from the pit. And yet, what he's saying here, no one even notices. Want an example of that? We've been studying Hosea together. Israel doesn't listen. Am I pointing them to the truth? He's saying here, God has spoken. Now, at this point in redemptive history, we can say definitively, not only that God has spoken, we know what God has spoken. He has given us his word, the breathed out word of God. Am I pointing them to the truth? Or am I receding back to the mixed counsel of the Canaanites? Finally, number nine, am I showing the only hope in Christ? Am I showing the only hope in Christ? Now, Elihu doesn't have all of the information here. We do know from reading Job that there is definitely, a, in, in, as Revelation progresses, that there is a, a messianic understanding. There's an understanding that a Redeemer is coming who will, who will pay a ransom and who will even resurrect a people from the grave. It, we, we know that by reading Job and Job's own words. And yet they don't have all the information of what will come subsequently in the rest of the Bible. Not yet. But in that sense, in the same way Elihu is pointing Job to his only hope in God, we, with more revelation, can point them to our only hope in Christ. In order to do that, you need to understand the order of things here. First is the bad news. You have to understand the bad news. And, and he gets into this in verse 19 through 22. He says, Man is also chastened with pain on his bed and with unceasing complaint in his bones. Some of you know that literally. You felt that this morning, right? Isn't it an amazing discovery of age that we can go to bed healthy, feeling great, and wake up and somehow in our sleep, we've hurt ourselves. And it's unceasing, he says here. This is the way things digress. Verse 20, so that his life loaves bread and his, soul, and his soul favorite food. The things that you once enjoyed, you, you don't even, they're, they're not even enjoyable anymore. This is the digression of the pain of the fall of Adam's helpless race of our sin taking its root in our souls. Even the things that we like and that we crave, we no longer like or crave anymore. In verse 21, his flesh wastes away from sight. His bones, which were not seen, stick out. You ever been to the Clearview Cancer Center here in Huntsville? The first time I walked in there, it was a jarring scene for me. Because I thought I had walked into what I had only read about up to that point into a concentration camp where this very thing was everywhere in front of me. And ultimately, verse 22, then his soul draws near to the pit and his life to those who bring death. There's no hope in any of that. It's good to be good stewards of our food, of our bodies, of our time, of our resources. That is a stewardship given to us by God. But to understand it rightly, bad news, it's not going to get better. There will be temporary victories. There will be things that will be helped. There will be things that will be saved. But ultimately, it's all going to death. The wages of sin is death. There is a way that seems right unto man, but in the end, it brings forth death. That, my friends, is the bad news. And you will not understand if you close your eyes to 19 through 22 and you think, yes, that's true of everybody else, but not me. Watch me in the gym. If you think I'm going to live forever and everybody thinks that at some point, then you will not understand 
the wondrous grace of the good news. In fact, to show them our only hope in Christ is to point them to the amazing news. We see this here in verses 23 through 30. We looked at this at Easter time, uh, but... But notice the language here. And again, if Job is the front porch to the whole Bible, listen to the language that he begins to, to give us. Listen to the vocabulary that he gives us right here at the beginning of our Bibles. If there is an angel as a mediator for him, now that angel there could be technically an angel, angel like you know the kind that flap wings and kill people in the Bible. It could be that, uh, but the word means messenger. Either way, what he's, what he's aiming at here is that there will be a heavenly being who will show him this mediation, who will answer all of these questions. If there is a messenger, a heavenly messenger as a mediator for him, so he's saying that that messenger will be that in his person. One out of a thousand to remind a man what is right for him. That phrase, one out of a thousand, if you remember way back in our study of Ecclesiastes years ago, in Ecclesiastes 7 is the only other place where that phrase, one out of a thousand, is used. And Solomon says, he goes, I've searched the whole earth. I have not found a woman. No kidding. He's tried. Uh, he says, and even among men, one out of a thousand, one that can help me. And that's who I'm looking to who he ultimately calls in Ecclesiastes 12, the shepherd of his soul. Where did he get that language? He got it right here. One of a, out of a thousand, this mediator. What will he do? Then let him, that angelic heavenly mediator, be gracious, verse 24, to him and say, deliver him from going down to the pit. This is what you will say in response, deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom and let his flesh become fresher than in youth. So even though the body decays, there is a new spirit and it's like he has a, a new life. It's almost as if he's been born again. Let him return to the days of his youthful vigor. And then, verse 26, he will pray to God and God will accept him that he may see God's face with joy and God may restore his righteousness to man. So man needs righteousness. That's the whole theme of Job. We're not right with God. We need God's righteousness and God is right. And God sovereignly will bestow his righteousness. God will impute his righteousness. It does not reside within us. It resides alone in Christ. And we are seen through the merits and the works of Christ. His final atonement, his righteousness, not ours. And what will be the result of that? Verse 27, it's a song of rejoicing. It's a song of salvation. We, we sing every Sunday. And, and here, by the way, friends, starting in verse 27, is the first salvation hymn in Scripture. The very first. What will, what will be the, the tune to the song? Verse 27, he will sing to men and say, I have sinned and perverted what is right and it is not proper for me. But he, as God, has redeemed my soul from going to the pit and my life shall see the light. That's the first song. The very first one. That's amazing news. What we have here is the language of salvation the language of hope, the language of restoration, the language of, even though the word's not used, covering forgiveness of sins. He has redeemed my soul. My body is still gonna waste away. Job said that. But even from my flesh, I will see God. I love the end of that. Is that just Job that God does this for? Verse 29. Behold, listen to this. God does all of these oftentimes with men. <laughs> this is the way God is. Our God is a saving God. This is how he responds. This is his desire. This is his, his, his work to bring back his soul, verse 30, from the pit that he may be enlightened with the light of life. Am I showing the only hope in Christ? The bad news, the amazing good news, and then... What else is left to do? It's to do what Elihu did. It is to plead with them to listen and respond. 
You and I cannot change someone's heart. You cannot comfort someone who refuses to be comforted. You ever tried that? But what you can do, whether they're an unbeliever or a fellow brother and sister that's suffering in Christ, is you can plead with them to listen and respond in patient, humble love. Look at verse 31. Pay attention, Job. Listen to me. He uses his name again. He's endearing himself in a personal way. Listen to me, Job. Keep silent and let me speak. Then, again, the humility of Elihu. Then, if you have anything to say, answer me. Speak, for I desire to justify you. I want to help you out. If not, listen to me and keep silent, and I will teach you wisdom. You know what happened? Job kept silent. And Elihu did exactly what he said he would, and he paved the way for God, and God comes in chapter 38, and he comes in the form of exactly the way he said he would to Job. Elihu said he's coming, and it's going to be a whirlwind. It's going to be a storm. You think a storm has come. Wait till you see God. And God is your redeemer. God is your friend. God is your only hope. And the good news is that he's not like us. We have people right now, today, dear, beloved saints that are suffering, that are in pain, that are, some may be suffering that you're not even aware of how they're suffering. Maybe they can't even put words to how they're suffering, but God knows and possibly God has and will providentially bring you across their path today, this week, this month, this year, in order to to be this to them, to be the light of Christ in their life, to be hope and encouragement and patience and love, meeting physical needs, meeting financial needs, meeting ultimately spiritual needs that are present. This is true for us because this has happened. And it's happened definitively and historically in Jesus. Everything that Job hoped for came true in Christ. Everything that Job closed his eyes wishing for and hoping for at the very end of his life, when he lays down his life in the dirt, it all came true. The Redeemer, the Mediator, the hope salvation and my life shall see the light have you thought about this that one day when we are joined together with Christ and we will all be with him forever and ever in a new heavens and a new earth the front porch to an eternal state that Job will be there with us because God has fulfilled his promises and will we're celebrating communion this morning And we're doing that because we are celebrating what has taken place already for the believer. In other words, by taking communion, this doesn't mean that we hope this will happen for us by taking it. That God will see our good works, that he will see our life, and that he'll say, there's one of my own. But actually, he'll see us in all of our frailties and all of our suffering and all of our pain. He has noticed us. He has seen us. And he has said to us in no uncertain terms, they can't help themselves. They cannot save themselves. They cannot rescue themselves. Only I can do that in Christ. And he's done that at the cross. Jesus, a real man, very God of very God, fully God, fully man, came to this earth He walked this earth with perfection, without sin. He walked in every way, in every path that we would walk in this life, every manner of temptation thrown and hurled at him, and yet faithful to the end, without sin. So that he could now rescue us from our sin. And he did that by dying on the cross. And he did that on that cross by having our sins, our transgressions, our nature nailed to that cross in such a way that it's not held against us. What was and should have been held against us was held against Christ. Not because he deserved it, but because we deserve it. 
And he has ransomed us. And he has put himself in our place as our substitute. And all those who know him because of that lavish grace know him by faith. We, we trust that his promises are true and amen, that they are everything that he said they would be. And they are. And that because of that, now we have the light of life and our lives are no longer the way they were. And even though our bodies will continue to decay and digress, yet there is a new life and a new sense, a new presence. And that is the indwelling Holy Spirit and the forgiveness of sins and restoration of relationship with God and his people and all resulting from union with Christ. Listen, if all that's not true of you by faith, you don't need communion. And we would ask humbly that you not take communion. If that's not true of you, that means that you're not a believer. But the good news is that you can confess your sins. God knows exactly who you are. He knows exactly what's in your heart. And he stands ready to forgive, ready to cover, ready to ransom, ready to heal, restore, and redeem for all who come to him in faith, receiving what only he can give, his grace and his mercy. I invite you to the table this morning. If that is true of you, if it's not, just hold back for a moment. Come and talk to one of us. We would love to talk to you more about what it means to follow Christ. This morning as you came in, you should have received a little disposable communion cup. If you don't have one, you might have missed it. Just slip up your hand if you need one, and our guys will get those to you. Just slip up your hand so that they can see you. Some over here. As Ben Holland led us in communion a few weeks back, and he reminded us uh, there's a, a top portion on this that has a piece of styrofoam in it. You know, even this is a reminder that things are not what they will be. That Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he said that there's actually a, this is a foretaste of a, of a greater feast that's going to come and I will have this feast with you and I will finish this feast with you in his kingdom. This morning, even what we take here, this is a reminder that not only the styrofoam, but this is a reminder that things aren't right that we're in the midst of a pandemic and there's things going on in the world and everyone's got opinions and all sorts of things. And yet, here we are. God calls us to commune together with one another and to remember Christ. As we do that this morning, would you search your heart, confess sin, but yet also rejoice that God has already forgiven our sins for all who come to him. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, we ask that you would work in our hearts your truth, your word. Lord, so that we would taste afresh your grace and your mercy as we are reminded of how good you have been to us as a church, as a people, as individuals. Those who are suffering this morning, Lord, we pray that you would bring to mind and heart and to their lives the very fact that our gracious Lord stepped out of a perfect heaven and stepped into a sin-ridden world and suffered not just with us, but for us. And now lives ever to make intercession for the beloved. So we cast our needs, our cries, our hurts, our pains before him this morning, knowing that he cares for us in our need. We ask this and we give you thanks in Jesus' name, amen. Paul said, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And when he had given thanks, he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If you would open up the ever so carefully as not to dye our carpet that's already blessed with coffee. This cup, someone said the first time we took it, it's really small. It is. And yet what it represents is eternal. 
Uh, what it stands in for this morning is something that we will never get to the bottom of, and that is the vicarious death, the blood of Christ. His robes for mine. We'll never get to the bottom of that. We'll never fully drink that cup. And one good part of that is because Jesus has already had that cup to the fullest for us. He drank it to its fullness. He drank of the cup of God's divine wrath so that we would not experience that. And so now as we take this this morning, we understand that Christ has done this in our place. And he told us what this cup represents. He says, Paul says in the same way he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. That new covenant reminds us that the Holy Spirit has come to indwell us, that we have free and full forgiveness of sins and that we have union with Christ. We belong to him and every single person who's in the new covenant knows the Lord Jesus. This is my body. This is the cup, the new covenant in my blood, which is for you. Drink it as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Amen. Got a few announcements. We will have a combined youth fellowship today over Zoom from 3.30 to 5. That will replace the, the youth study for the men during that time. It will also replace the, the young ladies fellowship tomorrow evening from 6.30 to 8. And I just wanted to thank you all. We created a meal sign up to help serve the Appersons this week and that need was completely met. The list was filled within a couple hours. I just wanted to thank you all for coming alongside them and loving this family. So there is no more needs there. Thank you so much as far as the mills are concerned. And before we hear the benediction, benediction and dismiss, just please, as always, well, in recent months, be mindful of social distancing and kind of the best way I think to do that around here is to fellowship outside or in the sanctuary versus the hallway. And so we'll just dismiss as by section We'll start here, and then here, and then here, and then here. All right? And we'll now close with a benediction or blessing, and it comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. And it says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete, without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. Amen.